Okay. So um, I'm going to give a kind of whirlwind tour, whirlwind tour of the um, state of the Python SDK. And uh, one of the things that um, I like about this, I'm, uh, if you, you know, know me, I'm a fan of Python, among other languages. And, but I also think Python is really exciting because it's the first non-Java runner, first non-Java SDK. So it's really a, um, a state of portability and how we're really having um, more than just Java, but all the, we open up to a bunch of other languages. So um, a lot of this has actually already been covered. So uh, this will be, be good. So in terms of new runners, well, we saw we had the portability story that really opens up the possibility to run Python on anything else. Um, previously, Python just ran on Dataflow, which was, you know, completely the antithesis of our portability story. We said, you know, run anywhere unless if only you're Java. So uh, we have the Flink runner. We saw an excellent demo of this. Um, this is getting uh, very close to completion. Um, you know, people are running it at a uh, production scale. Um, people are running it in um, production environments. It has a couple missing features, but probably the biggest missing feature is just kind of the fit and finish. You saw there's kind of a lot of setup involved, and so one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to make this really easy to just, you know, get up and running. Um, just recently, actually, um, Spark support was announced, I think it was actually this week, or, or late last week, um, that we now have a, a MVP for Spark, uh, for batch only for now, but um, that was able to leverage a lot of the things that Flink already had, and so uh, we we're, we're able to almost, um, compared to the amount of work it took to get Flink running with Python, um, Spark was kind of just pretty much a one person, a really amazing person, Kyle, um, effort for a couple of months. And now we have a Spark runner for batch and uh, streaming soon to follow. So this is very exciting. And um, there's also uh, the great thing about the portability thing is that now that the Python SDK supports portability completely, it's a simple matter to get your other runners. So um, Samza um, does, has fairly good support for portability already, not completely feature complete. But all these other runners, once they implement support for portability on their end, they'll get Python for free, and then Go for free in other languages as well. So that's kind of one of the big changes in, um, in this last year of the Python SDK, is you can now run it in many more places than before. Um, another runner to mention is you can actually run Java on the Python runner. Um, you may think this is just kind of, you know, a curious exercise, but this actually is very useful for testing. Um, you can ensure that you're not assuming things about your environment. Because when you run Java on the Python runner, it's not accidentally, you know, bundling in classes that you didn't think you were bundling. It's actually starting up Docker containers and running your things in a hermetic environment. Um, and this can be very useful for mirroring much closer to your production environment in a local environment. So the other um, kind of big development with Python, and this is why a lot of people are interested in it, is um, you have uh, TensorFlow extended. Um, a, a little, over, well, I guess it's almost two years ago, they made a big bet, and they said, well, Beam, Python especially, is kind of new. But, uh, but we want to be able to take advantage of the features of Beam and run data parallel systems um, on a variety of backends. And they didn't, they didn't want to have to deal with writing it for every single backend. So they kind of uh, um, cast their lots with us. And um, it's actually proved out uh, to be a really fruitful connection. There's, uh, there's a lot of components that they've built out that they're taking advantage now of Beam, and they're running them on Flink, they're running them on Spark, they're running them on Dataflow. Um, they're debugging things locally, and this has been a very exciting um, partnership. So you can see, and see there's, uh, these are the components of the TFX ecosystem. And the ones with the Beams here, that's half of them, those are running on top of Beam. Um, pretty much everywhere where Beam makes sense to run, they're running Beam. And then other ones, for instance, Trainer uh, uh, and Pusher and Model Server, those are running, those are already distributed TensorFlow uh, components. So, uh, so we're having a lot of uh, kind of explosion in the amount of people interested in doing ML on Beam and the capabilities for doing ML on Beam as well. So what about some uh, new features? Well, of course, um, when Python started out, it was just kind of like get an MVP out, you know, can you do group by key? Can you do map with maybe a side input, two side inputs? And uh, we've moved a lot um, beyond that quite a bit right now. And so a lot of the energy has been going into actually developing new features, new libraries to make the Beam SDK more complete. Um, we're catching up with Java. So there's been a lot of transforms, uh, everything from like approximate unique, um, regex, um, with key, kind of, kind of some of these convenience operators that Java's had for a long time. Well, now they're coming to the Python SDK. Um, there's certain features like uh, combined compact um, that allows you to do more efficient uh, combining. 
Um, there's features like setup and teardown. Um, these are things that Java SDK had that were just kind of missing. And we're going through and we're cleaning up a lot of this stuff and saying, we should have the full model in the Python SDK. No more should it be kind of a, you know, a secondary partial system, but it should support everything that any other SDK has. Um, there's been a lot of work on performance improvements. This is especially true with uh, when we're running Python at scale on Flink. You look at the profiles and you're like, that's really stupid. Why are we spending 80% of our time you know, serializing integers? And uh, so we, uh, you, when, you, when you see things like that, you go through and you say, well, I could do this about 10 times faster. And you go implement it 10 times faster. Now serializing integer squishes to this little tiny thing that you don't notice in your performance graph, and the next big thing comes up. Um, so we have uh, a lot of things. We have bundle processor reuse. So when you're redoing um, computations, especially in streaming, um, you don't have to reconstruct the entire execution graph every time. We have fast Avro, which is about six times faster. And even if you don't use Avro, this is important, because Beam uses Avro as an intermediate st storage format. Um, so there's a whole bunch of uh, um, optimizations and performance improvements that have gone on the last uh, six to nine months as well. Oh, we're shipping wheels by default, too. For those of you uh, who aren't familiar with the Python, Python ecosystem, you have Python code, and then you can also compile some Python code. Um, but this requires shipping per kind of platform information. So uh, that's, that's very useful as well. Um, we have a bunch of uh, things with I.O. So we have uh, Parquet, MongoDB were added recently. Um, a new data store. So data store has a new uh, Python 3 compatible connector that you can use in Python 2 or Python 3. Um, a lot of improvements to BigQuery. Um, a lot of improvements to file I.O. So now you can take a P collection of file names and then pass them into a text I.O. that says, get me all the lines in this P collection of names. Um, and similarly, a lot of improvements to uh, generic writing. And uh, the other thing is we've really completed the model. So uh, we added state and timers to the Python SDK that work uh, just as they do in Java. And uh, we also have Python SDK as the full first SDK to fully support splittable do fun and kind of like all this generality. Um, so this is very exciting. So <coughs> obviously, uh, it's going to take a lot of work to catch up to where Java is. Um, Java had about a two-year head start. And Java has about twice as many people working on it. And you say, well, is it just going to be like this you know, never-ending uh, uh, race to even try to get parity? And um, as you saw earlier today, um, it's not. So the other really big feature is multi-language pipelines. So the idea is that when you construct a pipeline in Python, you're not limited to what has been implemented in Python. If you have you know, my special you know, JDBC uh, Java connector, you can actually use that right from Python. And it calls out to Java, constructs a little kind of chunk of the graph, and then sends it back to Python. And then when you execute, you can execute in this multi-language environment. Um, this is really exciting for uh, IOs. It's exciting for uh, other kinds of transforms that are implemented in Java. And the other thing is you can go the other way around. So you can have something in Java and call a Python transform, for instance, that's using TensorFlow, and it works just as well. So uh, we think this will be a way of getting all SDKs to share all different transforms. And kind of instead of having to write things per, per language, you can really write things once and use it everywhere. Um, the other thing that you saw that's really big is Python 3 support. So um, kind of it's a mandate that you know if we're not, we're not having Python 3, we're kind of falling behind, because Python 2020 is end of life. But it's also an opportunity to take a lot of advantage of a lot of the features that Python 3 brings to the table. So what about um, a little bit about a community? Of course, this is a Apache project. So we care not just about the feature sets, but we care about the community. And here, Python 3 has made uh, a lot of good strides, too. So in terms of non-merge commits, we're up a little bit. So what I did is I looked at just, I don't have any stats on users, but I looked at GitHub to try to pull some quick stats. And I looked at 2018 up to mid-June, and then you know 2019 up to uh, mid-June, which was when I made this. And um, you can see that commits are up a little bit. Um, we've Edited lines of code is up quite a bit. So this is not um, total lines of code. This is the delta that we've done in six months. And the other thing that I'm really excited about is we have a lot more people contributing to the Python side of things. So I think this number is up from something like 40 to 70 distinct people that have contributed in a six-month period to the Python SDK with pull requests and commits and improvements and so on. So this is really exciting. So we're growing on the community front as well. That's reflected in the capabilities. So in short, um, the overall state of the Python SDK is uh, it's actually really good. We're growing well. We're getting a lot more features. And we're getting a lot more interest. So thank you. <laughs>